All right, um, we will go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for being here, everyone. My name is Keely Sheher. I am one of the co-stewards of the DC Evolution Working Group. Um, we are really excited about this turnout. We got a lot of content to cover tonight, great slate of presenters and topics. Um, wanted to just flag that we are recording this meeting and we're gonna send out the slides afterwards as well. Um, and please do feel free to participate in the chat. We love an active chat. Um, we've got a couple of Zoom monitors, um, James and John, they've got that Zoom help in their names. If you are having any issues, please reach out to them directly. Um, and we um, are gonna kind of dive in. So thank you so much again. Uh, we're here to talk about Police Abolition 101. Uh, wanted to start off by just acknowledging that the concept of abolition as a whole can be really uncomfortable and uncertain at times. It's really hard to imagine the logistics of how it's going to all work out to create a police-free future because it's something that's never existed in full. It's something that we're actively working on changing every single part of society in order to create and that means that the current conditions, we don't all have the answers, but we're going to struggle and we're going to work alongside one another yeah. in order to find them together. It's going to be messy. Um, it's full of so many organizers in every city trying out a whole bunch of different concepts and playing in politics to make those concepts even possible. I personally wish we could just kind of check a box that if we wanted a better abolitionist future um, without cops, it could be done right away. But the reality of that, it's a lot of table setting over the next weeks, months, years, and decades as organizers to make this future possible. So what we do know is that now that's not currently possible. The reality that we're working in isn't working for everyone. So even though it's gonna be difficult to make it happen and sometimes, sometimes hard to envision, we must work towards it no matter how hard it is. So if you go to the next slide, um, we kind of, say that abolition has, or um, abolition takes a lot of imagination. Um, we can't compromise, or sorry, we can't promise that all the concerns are gonna be wholly prevented while we're inventing this future, but this current system that we're living in can't either. What abolitionist thinking provides is a way of dealing with problems more effectively. We're trying to stamp out their issues at the root causes. Capitalism places the pursuit of profit at the center of its system, and a socialist places meeting human needs as a, at that core instead. So what we're talking about here is how can we meet those human needs? How can we address those deep inequalities directly instead of trying to manage the consequences of these deep inequalities? And when we describe it this way, the connection between abolition and socialism, which we'll talk about later, becomes a lot more clear. So if we go to the next slide, we'll look at the agenda. Um, it's a quick look. Some We've got some history and background before we really dive in. And then we do have time for questions at the end, like I mentioned. The goal here is not to convince you straight up to become an abolitionist, although that would be great. We just want to provide a lot of information so that you can understand it. This is a night school, so it's going to get deep. Um, and there's going to be a, likely some questions you have, concerns you have, and you probably want us to address a lot of those up front. And I promise we're going to get to them. We're going to have bunch of different sections to talk about that. We do want to save them till the, near the end, because if we try and deal with them too early, it's going to impede our ability to talk about these concepts as a whole. So buckle up. Um, I'm now going to kick it over to Comrade Farr to talk about copaganda. Uh, hello. Hi, I'm Farr Hihim. I'm in NOVA uh, and also in the Abolition Work Group. So yeah, let's talk about the role of media and culture informing our perceptions of policing and prisons, aka propaganda. So let's ask first, why do we, at least when we initially come to this question, take police and prisons for granted as like inherent parts or natural parts of society? So think about when you first learned about the police. Was it in a cartoon, a children's book? If you, if you want, you can chime in in the in, in the chat about what you you know, what, what memory you have of that. But as we can see in these examples, in children's media, uh, police are typically portrayed as all-purpose helpers, or they fall into the archetype of an authority, a leader, a good guy, a protector. So that's where we're starting our conversation with this topic. So yeah, next slide. Even in adult media, there's an endless supply of police uh, television here. Police are also always seen as good guys, as being on the side of justice, of protecting the vulnerable, like in the case of like law and order in Chicago PD, or they're a diverse force solving crimes with humor and wit in like uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. 
And this depiction is very much at odds with the role of police in society in reality and, and the ways that they actually work. And police media such as this all share implicit messages. They equate violence with crime and people who commit crime. They demonize and dehumanize criminals and criminalize populations. They hold the necessity of acts of violence and lawlessness committed by the police to contain disorder, which is a paradox in itself. They depict the criminal justice system as a process that is quick, efficient, and right, our rights and lawyers are what muck that up, make it slower, which is, and then these depictions often tend to be heavily racialized. And even documentary style media, such as live PD, cops, reinforce these themes. And the mainstream news, which typically presents police perspectives as factual or neutral, also reinforces that. Uh, next slide. Even shows like The Wire, which do offer perhaps more critical perspectives on policing, carry some of the same implications. The show might acknowledge as fail failure of our systems and does somewhat do some work to acknowledge deeper systemic root causes of crime. It still presents the police and prisons as intrinsic or natural to our society. And that there are good cops who are nobly struggling against broken systems to still do good work. So ultimately, all these sorts of perceptions are rarely challenge, challenged in media and save, save for moments of unrest or times of serious social upheavals like we are seeing as of late. Uh, next slide. But the problem is bigger than media representation. As stated by Angela Davis, the I, ideological work that the prison performs relieves us of the responsibility of seriously engaging with the problems of our society especially those produced by racism and inc increasingly global capitalism. So when what we are shown from a very early age depicts police and prisons as inherent and the problems of our society are disappeared from view, such as into prisons, we can begin to understand why some people's imaginations are so limited on this topic. We have, we are coming to this with some preconceived notions about it and we can start to tackle this by first taking a look at history. And here's the one and only Alf to talk about that. That's, that's the next slide, yeah. Hey y'all, uh, thanks Far. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try to talk about a whole lot of history very quickly, so bear with me. Um, let's go to the next slide. All right, so, before there was the police in the sense that we knew it, know them, uh, there were watchmen. Um, so this was a volunteer um, kind of like volunteer community policing. Um, they strolled the streets to discourage crime and search for lawbreakers. Um, so that was in Europe, um, you know, and throughout America. Um, but also there was the issue of slavery. So. The government of slavery was not a rule of law, it was a rule of the police. In, 19, in 1661, Barbados passed a slave law. It said, quote, Negroes and other slaves are wholly unqualified to be governed by the laws of our nations. And it created a special set of rules for the good regulating and ordering of them. So in 1680, Virginia adopted its own slave codes. Um, and in the 18th century New York, a person held as a slave could not gather in a group of more than three, could not ride a horse, cannot hold a funeral at night, cannot be out an hour after sunset without a lantern and cannot sell certain things. Um, so with these slave codes came slave patrols. So these patrols were established in this early 1700s and these patrols married the watch with the militia. Um, so it was required uh, of all able-bodied men to, to participate in these patrols. Um, so, that's the situation in America, but the first police in the modern sense actually started in the UK with the Metropolitan Police. It was established in 1829 in response to labor unrest and Catholic rebellions in Ireland. Uh, in like 30 years before then, in the late 1700s, a London magistrate, Colquhoun, published a treatise on the police of the metropolis. This was a text that inspired the formation of the Metropolitan Police. His major concern was order, and specifically how to establish an order that facilitates commercial society and regulates the laboring poor. 
His agenda is to develop a plan for regulating the morals of the useful class of the community. The usefulness of the poor was for Colquhoun and his class located in their labor. Crucial to capital's profits uh, was discipline, like disciplining that labor of the laboring poor. Um, interestingly enough, Colquhoun grew up in colonial Virginia, so he was very familiar with slave patrols, and his analysis was a direct uh, extension of the logic of slave codes and slave patrols. Turning back to America, the first publicly funded professional full-time police was established in the 1840s, first in Boston and then New York, Philly, then all over the place. Like Britain, population growth, widening inequality brought with from the Industrial Revolution, rising crimes such as prostitution and burglary, and hostility to immigrants from Ireland and Germany contributed to the emergence of urban policing. The British police was based on Peelian principles. Robert Peel was the guy who um, started the Metropolitan Police Department. And his principles had were trying to make the police explicitly not like the military. So the police were unarmed. They were to be thought of as citizens in uniform. However, in America, police have always been armed. Uh, Americans became vigilantes, killing indigenous people and people of color. This includes the police. So this is all throughout the 19th century. So Texas Rangers killed thousands of Mexicans. San Francisco Vigilance Committee was established in 1851 that arrested, tried, and hung people. Uh, LA Vigilance Committee targeted Chinese immigrants in particular. Um, and then the US Army itself in the late half of the 1850s onward also operated after, actually, after the Civil War, the US Army operated as a police force itself. Um, so the militia was organized into seven departments of permanent geographic standing armies, like the Department of the Dakotas, um, ETC, different other regions. And uh, they engaged in more than a thousand combat operations against native peoples. So next slide, please. So it is key that militarism has always been foundational to policing in America. There was a shift in 1909 um, from the police <laughs> There's a shift in 1909 because this guy August Vollmer came around and he was the chief of police in Berkeley, California, and he's thought of as the father of American policing. He was a veteran of the Spanish-American War. Uh, he implemented reforms to refashion the police into a military force. Um, he, part of these reforms were instituting a training model that was imitated all over the country uh, and several other, pro other professionalizations. So he made them wear uniforms. Um, he made them mobile. Um, so as a part of this, this era of policing, known as progressive era policing, uh, criminalized blackness, police patrolling black neighborhoods. Um, they disproportionately patrolled black neighborhoods and arrested black people. Uh, and social scientists observing the number of black people in jail decided black people were disproportionately, in, um, disproportionately criminal. So as a part of his... Um, training, he actually started a criminal justice program at UC Berkeley, and it was founded on eugenics. <laughs> um, so that also spread um, throughout the country in terms of how they thought about um, policing. So I, there's this quote included here, for years, ever since Spanish American war days, I've studied military tactics and used them to good effect in rounding up cricks. After all, we're conducting a war, a war against the enemies of society. So his big contribution was thinking of policing as um, how, you know, making an analogy between how we discipline um, people in America as we do like in the colonies when we have these colonial wars. So next slide. All right, so from the war on poverty to the war on crime, in the latter half of the 20th century to this day, there's been a massive rise in the prison population. Uh, there's a widespread assumption that the prison boom originated with Reagan and the Reagan administration's war on drugs and Nixon's law and order campaign and presidency. Uh, Elizabeth Hinton challenges that assumption in her book, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime. She instead wants to point to the bipartisan shared set of assumptions about race, poverty, and criminal behavior that led to this expansion and stresses the continuity from one presidential administration to the next. So in the late 60s, riots erupted throughout America, and LBJ began talking about fighting a war within our own boundaries. You can see a quote here, chief of LAPD police at the time, um, Chief Parker described suppressing the Watts Rebellion as similar to fighting the Viet Cong. Many people blame these riots on outside agitators and angry young black men, 
because they were the most visible group of the rioters. There was an official commission that was set to investigate what was causing this civil unrest. And they decided, they concluded that the cause was actually racism. They said, our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. It proposed aggressive, the report proposed aggressive government spending to provide equal opportunities to African-Americans, calling for an end to segregation, the creation of new jobs, housing, major changes to the welfare program and the diversification, diversification of local police and the media. Johnson flat out rejected the report and most of its recommendations were not implemented. There was also a massive state repression of civil rights leaders at this time, which we are, I assume most of us are familiar with. Um, alongside with this repression of civil rights leaders, there was an expansion of New York prisons under Rockefeller. So they started locking up a bunch of revolutionaries and that did of course lead to a wave of prison rebellions, most famously Attica in 1971, which is pictures from um, on the top left. Attica, they they proclaimed, we are men, we are not beasts, and we do not intend to be beaten or driven as such. Uh, their rebellion was motivated in part because of the brutal conditions at Attica at the time. In response to Attica, prison reforms were implemented in the decades following to prevent future uprisings. Part of this reform was uh, state education programs that we see in prisons now, where you can get a degree behind bars. They replaced the revolutionary study groups that kind of led to rebellions like Attica with these state sanctioned uh, education programs. All right, next slide. So this is George Jackson. His death um, was one of the catalysts. His murder was one of the catalysts for Attica. Um, and I wanted to highlight that he was saying, and right up, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's critical to teach people out there how important it is to destroy the function of prison within the society. Uh, and to show them in concrete terms that the war is on right now. And in that sense, we really aren't any different than the Vietnamese or the Cubans or the Algerians or any of the other revolutionary peoples of the war. So I think it's important throughout all of this to show how on the one hand, the state clearly thinks of um, policing as a war on people within it. Uh, and also how people who resist that, people who organize within prisons um, also conceive of this as this war. So next slide. All right, so cops today, stuff is not much better today. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So despite budget crises, states and municipalities are reluctant to cut police, prison, police and prison funding, opting to cut social benefits instead, as we've all seen. Municipalities have a financial incentive to over-police. At the time of Michael Brown's murder in 2013, municipal fees and fines accounted for 20% of Ferguson's budget and an average, and the household of Ferguson had an average of three arrest warrants. Paying for prisons is expensive, so the state is increasingly using surveillance as an alternative. So in this new era, the future of mass incarceration, we're seeing an increase in um, incarceration outside of prisons as well. So there's this, what that doesn't recognize is that there's a false binary between incarceration and surveillance. So an example I wanted to look at is ankle monitors. So ankle monitors have been heralded as this progressive reform um, in places where cash bail has been eliminated, increasing dependence, there's increasing dependence on monitoring as an alternative to pretrial detention. Uh, these monitors have exorbitant daily fees and the state gets a kickback on all of those fees. E-jail is still jail. Uh, there are dozens of rules governing where and with whom uh, people who are being monitored can live, the types of jobs they can have, how and when they can seek medical care and with whom they can socialize. Um, so really what we're seeing here, I don't have time to talk about everything because <laughs> I'm going on too long, but what we're seeing is an expansion of surveillance and the expansion of the carceral state, um, especially outside of, of prisons. But of course there is, we still are at the largest prison system. Uh, in the world. So next slide. So there's a crisis of police fatality with over a thousand deaths per year and rising, including Sonia Massey, who was murdered on July 6. Um, in response, there's a growing movement against police and prisons, a movement that brought a lot of us to the left and to DSA in the first place. As we fight for a better world, it's important that we be clear-eyed and careful about the reforms we fight for because of the unintended effects, as the last slide's discussion on ankle monitors shows. 
With that, I'll pass it over to Keely, who's going to talk more about the pitfalls of reform. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth. Keely is not doing this section, but she'll be doing other sections later on. Uh, Elizabeth, she, her, I, I live in Ward 1, and I've also lived in Wards 2 and 4. Um, so now you've heard a lot from ALF about how police have been historically and present day uh, very violent, uh, how they're used to engage in literal warfare against people who are seen as the enemies of society. Um, but, you know, people will say, well, policing is broken, so we need reform. And to that, what we say is no, reform will not work because the system is actually not broken. Can we go to the next slide. You cannot reform something that is not broken. Policing is not broken. It's actually working really well. The function of policing is to use state violence to maintain an oppressive social order. So there is a really useful and succinct phrase that I saw recently. The purpose of a system is what it does. Or I don't know if people call it posywid. But, you know, that's a really helpful way of thinking about policing. And you've probably also heard this other phrase, that something is a feature rather than a bug. And in the case of police violence, police violence is a feature of policing. It's not a bug. Policing is inherently violent. Police and prison guards and other folks in the system, they systemically brutalize Black and brown people, disabled people, and other oppressed populations to control them, to suppress them. Right? They systemically rape, detained, and incarcerated folks of all genders, again, to control and suppress them. The purpose of a system is what it does, and the purpose of policing is to control and suppress people who are seen as enemies of society. Now, why do they do this? It's because policing maintains capitalism. The function of policing is to visit violence upon people in order to protect property. And you can see this very clearly when you consider, say, petty theft, versus wage theft. When you steal from a Target, that's a crime and you'll go to jail. But if Target steals from their workers, that's not a crime. The bosses just have to pay a small fine out of their billion dollar profits. Or consider protesting genocide versus doing a genocide. When you protest genocide, the cops can arrest you. They can jail you for quote trespassing or quote terrorism. They could even kill you. But if you're Biden or Netanyahu doing a genocide against Palestinians in the service of capitalism and empire, the cops will line up to protect you. You will get standing ovations. So policing is not broken. It's working really well. And the thing is, we've already tried reform. OK, Elf walked you some of this already. Um, but we know that after the Civil War, southern cities began hiring black cops. And we actually see a version of that today in the form of what people call community policing. But this was done because um, white folks wanted to control the formerly enslaved population. Um, but key catch, black cops were not allowed to arrest white people. And why is that? That's because it would have undermined a core function of policing, which is upholding white supremacy. Um, in 1968, you heard about the Kerner Commission, which recommended investing in poor black communities to reduce violence. Would have been great. But that would have undermined another core function of policing, which is exploiting Black people's labor and keeping them permanently, perpetually dispossessed. So those recs were, those recommendations were tossed aside. Um, the report also acknowledged that, quote, police are trained to keep order in Black neighborhoods with the use of unchecked violence. So they were pretty honest about what they were doing. In 2014, we saw a number of Obama-era reforms, community policing, anti-bias training, de-escalation training, diversity hiring, body cameras. Those practices were very widely adopted, but they did not reduce police violence. Police kill about 1,000 people a year that we know of in this country that has remained largely unchanged. And then in 2020, we were inundated with that viral eight can't wait graphic, those reforms, which we'll examine a little bit more closely on the next slide. But key thing is most police departments already had them. Next slide. So here we have the eight reforms. And, you know, I, I'll just start by saying it's very telling that cops supported these reforms. Um, so the, the man who came up with them, D. Ray McKesson, is a professional activist and grifter. Um, and he went viral in 2020 with the eight can't wait graphics. He claimed that these eight reforms would reduce police violence by up to 72 percent. And those eight reforms were banning chokeholds, requiring de-escalation, requiring warnings before using deadly force requiring the exhaustion of alternatives before the use of deadly force, 
requiring a duty to intervene, essentially having good cops intervene when bad cops do bad things, which is uh, you know, a fallacy. Um, ban on shooting at moving vehicles, requiring a use of force continuum, you know, like a progressive use of force, um, and comprehensive reporting. But they don't work. So guess what? Let's look at duty to intervene on the bottom left. George Floyd, as we all know, was killed in Minneapolis. Minneapolis at the time had already required its cops to intervene when a colleague uses excessive force. But we all know that the three officers did not intervene when one of them was killing George for eight minutes and 46 seconds. They all just stood there and watched. Now go look at a, the warning before deadly force uh, recommendation. Breonna Taylor was killed in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville had already required its cops to issue warnings before shooting, but we all know that those Louisville cops burst into Brianna's room without warning when she was sleeping and shot her without any warning whatsoever. So you know that a reform is meaningless when cops already have them, they brag about it, um, and, and that's what we see here on the right, the San Jose Police Department bragging on June 11th, 2020, at the height of the racial justice uprisings, that they had already met all of the eight can't wait criteria. And they were bragging about this while they were busy tear gassing and violently repressing the 2020 protesters be who were protesting them for being violent. Um, and as an aside, just you know, looking at this, this graphic of eight recommendations, um, for those of us who are here in DC, um, the eight can't wait website reported that DC cops have already met seven of the eight reforms. And we know that they are notorious for being violent too. So we have discussed why reform doesn't work because the system isn't broken, policing is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. So now I'll turn it over to my comrade Nikita to walk through a few examples of how the police state is more violent and powerful than ever. Hi hey, y'all, my name is Nikita, my pronouns are she, her. I'm part of Northern Virginia DSA. And um, yeah, so in my section, I'm gonna be talking about current events that have been leading to the expansion of the police state. While politicians have been talking about reform in one breath, they've been expanding the state in the other. So now we're gonna discuss some of the policies at both local and national level. All right, so just this year, the DC City Council proposed a massive crime bill that combined many smaller bills that were proposed back in 2023. Um, at the end of all that, it was over 100 pages long. Some of the harmful provisions in the bill include drug-free zones that give police sweeping powers to stop anyone that they claim to claim to suspect of using or carrying drugs, a face covering ban, which allows them to stop anybody who they think is covering their face in order to commit a crime. Um, that would include ski masks and scarves in the winter, as well as masks for health reasons, um, and expanded permissions for police to use neck restraints and engage in dangerous high-speed car chases. This bill was just approved and became law like right at the end of June. This package of bills massively increased the power of DC police, which is in direct opposition to true public safety. Um, back when this bill was being debated in March, um, organizations like Harriet's Wildest Dreams and DC DSA Abolition organized against this bill and were teaching folks how to testify at public hearings, meeting privately with council members and staff, mobilizing over 25,000 emails and calls to DC council opposing the bill and packing the room with hundreds of community members when the council voted on the bill and its amendment. So if you're curious what that kind of work resisting bills like this looks like, that's a small sample of what that looks like. Uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide. All right, so at the national level, we saw violent police crackdowns earlier this summer against university encampments that were demanding university divestment from Israel, financial divestment from Israel. University students and staff were brutalized by police with the permission of their university administrations. In the DMV, there was an encampment at George Washington University, which was allowed to continue for weeks. Um, I actually went there, stopped by, it was really lovely. It went on for weeks until at random at 4 a.m. one night, hundreds of police were deployed and used pepper spray and physical violence to tear down the encampment. This and what we saw at like dozens of other colleges across the country a couple just a couple months ago reflects a growing criminalization of the right to protest in America. Protests are supposed to be inconvenient and disruptive because they're supposed to be getting something done. They're supposed to be an expression of upset, but inconvenience is increasingly being used to justify state violence. Do the next slide. All right. 
Okay, so something that's been less covered in the news is the construction of police training facilities known as cop cities. This section is going to be a bit dense, so bear with me all. I'm assuming that a couple people here at least haven't heard about this or don't know too much about it. So a couple of years ago, activists in Atlanta discovered the planning of an 85 acre police training facility, which included scale models of city blocks for police to practice urban warfare, which led to the nickname Cop City. Um, a powerful civil rights movement soon formed in Atlanta to fight this project with the stated goal that Cop City will never be built. This movement has been aggressively and violently suppressed by both the Democrat run city government Atlanta, of Atlanta and the Republican run state government of, of Atlanta, of Georgia, I'm sorry, Georgia. For a long time, activists were occupying the forest where the construction site was planned in order to block the construction. In January of 2023, Environmental activist Tortuguita, who's pictured on the slide here, was found by police while alone and was shot 57 times in what has been likened to a state execution. Their murder actually marked the first killing of an environmental activist in U.S. history. So the police lied, as they do, and said that Tortuguita shot at them first. Autopsy reports came back to show that the injured cop had, in fact, been shot by a fellow officer and that Tortuguita had no gunshot residue on their hands at all. The shooting was ruled a justified shooting and no cops have been charged with the murder and will not be charged with the murder. Throughout all this, 61 protesters have been hit with RICO charges, which if you don't know what those are, they're racketeering charges that are usually used against the mob and more recently and famously against Donald Trump for conspiring to overturn our last election. Over 50 activists are also facing domestic terrorism charges, and both of these charges have been widely condemned by civil rights group. Civil rights groups. Um, they're going to be linked on the next slide for you to learn more about those charges, but just a couple more updates about this. Again, sorry, I know this is a bit dense. Um, one of the most recent updates is that the Cop Stop Cop City activists launched a, mass, a massive campaign to collect signatures to put Cop City on the ballot and let Atlanta voters decide whether it should be built, given that it's going to be using $60 million of taxpayer money. They collected 116,000 signatures from Atlanta residents in support of the referendum, which was double the required number. I think the required number was like 58K. Um, for context, the city of Atlanta has 500,000 people, which means that they collected signatures from over 20% of the city. So you would think, you know, 20% of the city wants us to go to a vote. The government should be listening to that that should happen, but no, the city declined to hear the resolution entirely. They've made up new rules to block the referendum from happening. They also doxed the petition signers, 20% of their own constituents. They doxed them by publishing the petitions online with none of their personal information redacted except for their birthdays. So in response to the movement in Atlanta, other cities like New York City and Dallas are now proposing building their own cop cities. The movement in Atlanta is continuing and it's really important to raise awareness to what's been happening and fight back against the construction of cop cities nationally and in our neighborhoods. Training police in urban warfare and giving them millions of dollars of shiny facilities in which to learn how to kill people better will never, never make us safe. Thank you so much, Nikita. Um, so you all have, you know, now heard a lot about how the current system is failing us. It's working really well for the ruling class, right? It's not broken for them, but it is broken for us. So what do we need instead? Well, we need abolition. So let's talk about what that is. Next slide. So this is a quote on the top left from Ruth Wilson Gilmore. She's an academic and abolitionist organizer, and she's also a professor of geography and really one of the luminaries in abolitionist theory um, for the past several decades working in the Black radical tradition. So what she says about abolition is, abolition is a movement to end systemic violence, including the interpersonal vulnerabilities and displacements that keep the system going. The goal is to change how we interact with each other and the planet by putting people over profits, welfare over warfare, and life over death. So let's talk a little bit about what she's saying here. When she says systemic violence, what she's referring to is that, you know, politicians and mainstream media really like to talk about crime like it's an individual failing. But as abolitionists, we like to talk about harm. We recognize that harm is produced by systems of oppression, and it can't be isolated to discussions of individuals. When she talks about interpersonal vulnerabilities, she's recognizing that we harm each other because we are taught to interact with each other with carceralism instead of care. 
And using abolition as a framework, we can change our interpersonal interaction so that we are less likely to harm each other. Um, when she talks about displacements, the thing is carcerality literally physically displaces people. Right, it displaces people into ghettos, and by what I by that what I mean is poor urban areas where minoritized and racialized people live. It displaces people into food deserts where people lack access to fresh, nutritious food. It displaces people into prisons where violence is not eliminated, although it's you know promoted that way. But violence is simply relocated into a place where people cannot escape and then concentrated upon them. When Ruth Wilson Gilmer talks about people over profits, what she is making reference to is that abolition is not just about tearing down police and prisons and calling it a day. It's about building up and transforming the conditions of society and really recognizing you know, people over profits, welfare over warfare, life over death, that abolition also requires socialism. And you'll hear more about that later. I also really like this quote on the bottom right from Maryam Kaba, who is also an abolitionist organizer and writer, very prolific highly recommend that you follow uh, both of them on social media. Uh, Mariam Kaba is prison culture on Twitter. Now, Mariam says, I am actively working toward abolition, which means I'm trying to create the conditions necessary to ensure the possibility of a world without prisons. And I think this is a really helpful framework for understanding how we think about abolition, that it's not just that we want to remove all police and prisons and do nothing else. It's that we want to create the conditions that are necessary to make a world without prisons possible. And in order to make that world possible, we will first need to understand the difference between crime and harm. So let's go to the next slide. Crime and harm are completely different things. Crime is an act that is illegal, specifically that is criminalized. That's it. It's just the illegal stuff that you can do that will get you sent to prison. Harm is an act that creates unmet needs in the victim. So specifically, harm has a victim. When a victim is harmed, they now have unmet needs that need to be fulfilled. So they might have a need for medical care, mental health therapy. They might need new housing. They might need food, clean air, clean water. They might need a new job or safe transportation, right? There's an unmet need there. And the difference between these two is that many crimes are completely harmless and many harms are not criminalized. So you can see in this chart on the right-hand side, you have crime and harm on two axes. And in the upper right quadrant, you see things that are harmful and criminalized. These are the things that most people think of as crimes. For example, murder, assault, rape, battery, right? On the lower left, you have sort of the opposite. You have the things that are both harmless and not criminalized. Um, and these are the things that lead people to conflate all actions that are legal with actions that are good. Yes, some actions that are legal are good, but that's not true for everything. And you can see that illustrated on the upper left. These are the actions that are harmful, but not criminalized. So these are legalized harms. These are things like war, the death penalty, police murder, assault and harassment, solitary confinement, which is a form of torture, Incarcer and by the way, also used on young people, minors in DC. Incarceration, the fundamental existence of ICE, CP CBP, and DHS. Um, evictions, tear gas, which is illegal to be used in warfare, but perfectly legal, by the way, when used against civilians in the United States. Wage theft, industrial waste, labor exploitation, pharmaceutical profiteering. Not a complete list, but you can see that a lot of this is state violence and corporate violence. And these are uh, some of the many types of harm that abolitionists and socialists are concerned with, but they're completely legal. And then on the lower right, you have the things that are harmless, but criminalized. So this is what we refer to as a criminalized existence. These are things that cops are primarily concerned with. So these are things like vandalism. Looting, I, you want to put these words in quotes, right? Um, defacing Confederate monuments, trespassing, protesting, drug use, loitering, sex work, homelessness, which the Supreme Court recently held, it's actually okay to criminalize homelessness, right? In the Grants Path case. Driving while Black, walking while Black, running or otherwise existing while Black. So these are actions that are, um, we've labeled them as harmless, right? They, they fall on the harmless part of the, uh, the quadrant. Um, 
but they're not necessarily completely harmless. What we mean is that they're not harmless to somebody else, to a third party in the way that the state conceives them to be under our current criminal system. But they actually can be quite harmful to the person themselves. For example, being homeless is very harmful. It's violence against the person who is unhoused. Um, but anyways, so, you know, taking a step back, when we understand that crime and harm are two completely different things, that many crimes are harmless, many harms are not crimes, then we begin to understand that crime is just not a useful construct at all for thinking about the kind of society that we want to live in. Crime is only a useful construct for thinking about a way to control people, to exploit and dispossess people. Um, and as a side note, this is why Kamala Harris's current campaign, focusing on her as a prosecutor, which is a type of cop, contrasting her with Trump as a felon and a criminal is actually extremely harmful because this rhetoric reinforces that felon and criminal are good, objectively accurate ways of labeling people who are therefore undeserving of rights and respect. Um, let's go to the next slide. So, so what is abolition? It's an organizing demand. It's a very ambitious one because what we're doing is we are setting a vision and a horizon for ourselves for building a world without police and prisons. And it is asking us to change everything that we understand to be possible and asking us to reconsider the things that we take for granted. And generally speaking, abolitionists will include ending capitalism as a part of abolition. Abolition also distinguishes between harm and crime like we just discussed, right? And the distinction is really easily illustrated when you think about, well, what's the easiest way to end all crime? The easiest way to end all crime is just to make everything legal, right? This really lays bare the uh, reality that crime is just a construct. It's just what we've said is illegal. That's it. That's what crime is, right? But our goal is not to just bring crime down to zero. Our goal is to eliminate harm, including harms that are not crimes. We talked about that on the last slide, but you know things like price gouging, wage theft, environmental degradation. So making this distinction clear requires us to do the ideological work of questioning why criminals have been constituted as a class of human beings who are undeserving of the civil and human rights that are accorded to others. This is a quote from Angela Davis, and it's a really helpful way of thinking about the you know, felon criminal convict language that we're seeing in this election cycle. Abolition also sees the system working as intended, right? We just talked about this earlier. Policing maintains an oppressive social order. Um, it is used to threaten and control populations that are seen as subversive or dangerous, and that includes black and brown people, poor and unhoused folks, um, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault who fight back or speak out. It's used against um, gender and sexual minorities who assert bodily autonomy through abortion, gender surgery, etc. Abolition seeks to address the root causes of actually harmful behavior. It understands that people steal because they're poor. They commit violence because they're not taught about sexual consent or how to self-regulate emotions or because they themselves were first victims of trauma and violence before they became purveyors of violence and harm. Abolition is a framework. It's not just a single idea, right? People often want easy answers, to address every social harm, but we don't actually have all the answers yet. But what abolition does is provide us a framework for thinking about how to address the root causes of harm. And finally, abolition is a way of thinking about reform. The, the reality is that abolitionists do not actually reject all reforms, right? We, we talked about how reform won't work in the traditional sense, the way that it's being used right now by the status quo. But what we do organize and fight for are what are called non-reformist reforms or abolitionist reforms. These are reforms that reduce the power, scope, and legitimacy of policing. So for example, defunding police is a great abolitionist reform. It's a concise, pithy slogan, and it's also a demand because it's explicitly saying we want to remove funding from police. Um, it's specific and it's a material demand that unfortunately its detractors have maligned as vague. Um, but okay, let's, let's get into some abolitionist reforms. Next slide, please. So there are the reformist reforms, which we oppose because they uphold the status quo. And then there are the abolitionist non-reformist reforms, which are good and should be pursued. How do we know the difference? There are four fundamental questions that you should ask yourself to understand whether something is an abolitionist reform or a reformist reform. So you can see on the slide here, number one, does it reduce funding to police? Number two, 
Does it challenge the notion that police increase safety? Number three, does it reduce the tools, tactics, and technology that police have at their disposal? And number four, does it reduce the scale of policing? So let's apply two examples on this slide so we can understand you know, how these questions operate. So look at the top there the, in the red, um, and let's examine body cameras. So body cameras were this big popular reform proposal that came about about a decade ago, really, you know, uh, everybody was talking about it. They were saying, this is the solution to police violence, but we have seen that they don't work. And in fact, cops just find ways to turn them off. They, uh, you know, lobby for laws that allow them to redact camera evidence from publicly released footage. So let's look at these four questions. Do body cameras reduce funding to police? No, they increase funding. Because by equipping police officers with body cameras, it will actually require more money to go toward police budgets. Okay, do body cameras challenge the notion that police increase safety? No. Body cameras are pitched as making police more accountable, which actually promotes the idea that policing, when it's done right, when it's, you know, when you only have the good cops or whatever, that actually makes people safer. Number three, do body cameras reduce tools, tactics, and technology that police have at their disposal? Absolutely not. It's a new technology, right? They, pro they provide police with yet another tool. It increases surveillance, increases police budgets to acquire more of these gadgets. Number four, do police cameras reduce the scale of policing? No, it increases it. Body cameras are based on the idea that police who do not use excessive force are therefore less threatening. But police can turn off body cameras and when used, footage often doesn't have the impact that community members want or it is actually used to surveil members of the public instead. So the answer to all four of these questions is a resounding no, and that's why we understand that body cameras are a reformist reform, not an abolitionist reform. On the second part of the slide in the green, we have another proposal, and that is to suspend the use of paid administrative leave for cops that are being investigated. So right now when cops get investigated for misconduct, a lot of times they get paid while they're, you know, being investigated. And it's just like taking a vacation after they've murdered. Um, so does suspending the use of paid administrative leave, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is that abolitionist or is that reformist? Well, let's ask the questions. Number one, does it reduce funding to police? Yes, because now you are not paying them while they are being investigated, right? This increases community-based budgets as municipalities no longer pay for policing's harm against community members. Does suspending the use of paid administrative leave challenge the notion that police increase safety? Yes, it challenges the notion that policing violence and that administrative costs that it incurs are essential risks of creating safety. Because when you pay for it, you're basically saying, well, this is just part of the cost of doing policing, which is good. But when you stop paying them, you're saying, no, actually, this is not just part of, this is not an essential part of creating safety. Does suspending the use of paid administrative leave reduce tools, tactics, and technology that police have at their disposal? Yes, access to paid administrative leave lessens the consequences of use of force and presumes the right of police to use violence and, and the presumption that the police have the right to use violence at all. Number four. Does suspending the use of paid administrative leave reduce the scale of policing? Yes. The less financial support for police undergoing investigation for killing and excessive use of force, the less support for policing overall. So once we understand these questions, they're a very valuable framework for abolitionist analysis of any policy or proposal. So there's other proposals like community policing, more police training, civilian oversight boards, the demand to kill, to excuse me, to jail killer cops. And the answers, when you ask these four questions for those proposals, the answers are no, we're not actually challenging the idea that police increase safety. We're not actually reducing the scale of policing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a common proposal here in DC that maybe we should build a newer and better prison or a newer and better jail with better amenities because the existing ones are overcrowded and dirty. And no, that's actually not an abolitionist reform. The solution is actually to free people from cages. Um, and then there are the there are the proposals that end up with uh, yes answers, right? Withholding pension from uh, con from police that are um, uh, found responsible for misconduct, not rehiring cops who have been fired for misconduct, capping their overtime, withdrawing police from militarization programs like the deadly exchange program with Israel prioritizing health, housing, education, and other actually 
um, life-giving investments, reducing police, reducing the police force, literally defunding the police. These the answers when you you know put these proposals to the four questions are a yes, and we support them. So uh, I'll wrap up now. The next slide, keep it short. I just want to circle back to the eight can't wait reformist reforms that didn't work. Um, that were already in place when George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were murdered. Um, you may have seen an abolitionist answer to that uh, that came out maybe a couple days later. It was called Eight to Abolition. And when you ask those four questions, the answers are a resounding yes for the eight proposals on the right side of your page. So defunding the police, demilitarizing communities, removing police from schools, freeing people from, from prisons and jails, um, repealing laws that criminalize survival, investing in community self-governance, providing safe housing for everyone, and investing in care, not cops. So these are proposals that support, that will make possible a world where there are actually zero police murders because there are actually zero police. Um, and these are things that we support as abolitionists because abolition can't wait. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to my comrade, Ben, to connect abolition to other progressive and radical goals that organizers and other DSA working groups are working toward. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. My name is Ben. Pronouns are he and him, and I'm an organizer here in D.C. Um, so now that we know broadly what abolition is, I'm going to set it in a larger context of leftist struggles for justice and against the ravages of racial capitalism. So abolition intersects with and underpins all of these fights and many more. And I think it makes sense to start off this segment with this very apt quote from Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Abolition requires that we change one thing, which is everything. Indeed, we cannot create a world without police and prisons without also defeating capitalism, racism, and imperialism. Now, one way to react to that is, well, that sounds like an impossible task before us. But what it means for us here and now is that there are so many ways to get plugged into these fights because they are all deeply connected. Next slide. So I'm going to dig into one example in detail around housing justice, and then I'll touch very briefly on a few additional examples. So the connection between housing and public safety is incredibly clear. When people have dignified, high quality, affordable, and sustainable housing, they're safer. But in most cities and communities in this country, housing is a commodified good sold to the highest bidder and controlled by the ruling landlord class, which leads to widespread housing insecurity, homelessness, and general precarity. Now, these cities, much like D.C., must manage this precarity somehow, and they do so through policing, often with tragic results, and to such an extent that even those with stable housing are not safe from the violence of policing. This was the case famously with Breonna Taylor, who was murdered in her home in 2020, and it was the case, a uh, really tragic case just a few weeks ago on July 6th with Sonia Massey, who was also murdered in her own home by the police whom she had called for help because she feared an intruder. Now, it's worth pointing out that LGBTQI plus folks are especially housing vulnerable. Um, and this is even more so for youth who are often kicked out of their unsupportive parents' homes, for example, putting them at higher risk of facing all kinds of interpersonal violence, including police violence. Um, evictions in which cops forcibly remove people who are behind on rent on behalf of landlords are inherently violent, and they expose people to greater risk of experiencing violence once they're thrown out of their own homes. And lastly, unhoused folks are especially vulnerable to state violence. And in fact, the Supreme Court just ruled that cities can officially ban sleeping in public places, giving these cities even more of a green light to sick cops on unhoused people. Our cities continually invest in policing in order to basically throw unhoused people in and out of jail and trash their belongings, all while steadfastly refusing to actually give them the homes that they need. But DSA, thankfully, has multiple ways to fight back. Our Stomp Out Slumlords Working Group fights for tenants' rights and protects people from evictions. And our social housing working group is fighting to pass a Green New Deal for social housing. Next slide. So that's just one example of how policing intersects with another struggle. And I'll just quickly touch on a few more. When it comes to reproductive justice, police are the ones who are enforcing abortion bans and targeting pregnant people. 
There's also a long sordid history of prisons enacting policies of forced sterilization on inmates. And in fact, the very act of imprisonment is an act of family separation. As for environmental justice, we see time and time again how police violently shut down indigenous led movements for climate justice and how climate disasters always impact poor and racialized peoples the most while police are sent to ostensibly help and only add to the tragedy as happened with Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Now cops always target the most vulnerable people and that includes queer, trans and gender nonconforming folks including enforcing anti-trans legislation and at best doing absolutely nothing and at worst aiding and abetting the fascists who routinely threaten queer and trans spaces. And of course, I must mention labor here because as we heard at the beginning of this presentation, cops were explicitly created and designed in part to crack down on striking workers, to enact violence on behalf of the bosses. And this is a duty they have gleefully performed for hundreds of years. I like to sum up this point by saying that cops are not workers because violence is not a job. Now you can learn much more about these and other intersections with abolition um, at this website, defundmpd.org slash ydefund, uh, which some of us helped write a few years ago as part of the Defund MPD coalition here in DC. Um, in short, police are a violent roadblock to every single movement for justice. Thankfully, we can fight back by organizing. Now here in our local DSA chapter, we have groups fighting on all of these fronts, repro justice, socialist feminism, public power, trans rights and bodily autonomy, and labor. And of course, all of us presenters today are in the abolition working group, which explicitly fights against the police state in DC and Northern Virginia. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Hayden to talk about abolition and socialism. Thanks, comrade Ben. Um, hey guys, I'm Hayden, he, him. Um, I am going to basically tie it together and tell you how socialism meets abolition, right? So far, you've just kind of been taking our word for it, but we're gonna use the immortal science of dialectical materialism to really understand um, how these things interact with one another because I am one of the many resident theory nerds of uh, Metropol Metro DC DSA. So, um, if you'll go to the next slide, to understand this, we need to discuss, first of all, one of the worst crimes against humanity, and that is fashion. I'm, I'm just joking. Fashion is not a crime. Um, fashion does not do any harm, but it is a great way to demonstrate how material reality shapes culture, right? So if we look in the 1910s, we can see that women used to wear primarily larger coats and longer um, dresses. Right. And a big reason for this is because you were riding in a open top horse strong carriage everywhere. Right. And you would, you would be cold. So you needed to put on a dress and put on a big coat. However, in just a short 20 or 30 years or so in the 1940s, you can see how much shorter women's dresses and uh, women's dresses and sleeves were, as well as how women wore much lighter coats. A, a large part of this is because uh, cars became commonplace and women and many other people were driven from place to place and dropped off from at a door or drove to a door, didn't have to walk in the cold, didn't have to sit in the cold um, with a horse-drawn carriage. And so therefore, um, were able to wear shorter clothing, less heavy clothing. So the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, our material reality shapes our culture and our culture simultaneously reinforces the material conditions that we exist in, right? Because women started wearing shorter skirts, they also started driving more places because they would be cold. They weren't gonna walk there. So these things are um, mutually reinforcing. And, and that's what, I, what we really want you to understand, especially as it applies to culture and policing. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. See, this is how culture reproduces itself and the same thing applies for public safety culture. So as mentioned earlier, policing protects public pro or protects property, right? By, pay by placing property at the center of the uh, emphasis of the system, it creates uh, an incentive to protect property over people and simultaneously um, emphasizes the aesthetics of safety, making people feel safe rather than actually being safe themselves, right? Uh, additionally, it 
also gives a very convenient outlet for social for justified social tension right um due to the insane amount of sort of disenfranchisement and um disgruntlement or some people will call it alienation with our existing social system under capitalism um people have very justified qualms with society and with the system they exist under and therefore uh are, and don't really know where to direct it so policing gives a really convenient way to not direct that towards the people that deserve it the capitalist class but instead direct it towards people that look different from you or are poor right and so this in turn criminalizes the underclass um <laughs> Um, I see something in the in the thing. Um, this in turn criminalizes the underclass, right? So uh, basically, what this does is this drives down labor costs because it's a it's a simple supply and demand uh, equation, right? Um, the more people you have willing to do labor, the less people. Um, or the less you have to pay those people, right? It gives a very convenient way to point to somebody and say, um, you don't wanna end up like them, so you're gonna work for whatever amount of money that I tell you, right? In turn, this means that more people are doing labor not to sustain themselves, but instead to um, receive a wage and are, uh, are having to sell their labor power day over day and move into cities and 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 work under these conditions, right? This term is often called proletarianization. Um, this also enforces a, a constant demand for consumer goods because people are no longer growing their own food and sewing their own clothes and producing their own things, but instead they're working in a city, selling their labor power for hours on end, and then have to still feed themselves, right? So this also benefits capitalists because. Um, we are now buying things, right? And additionally, in America in particular, um, it reproduces the social relations of the slave system. Um, so then in turn, what this does is because we see um, some groups of people as, um, as quote unquote lesser, some people are criminalized, um, as well as uh, police are constantly patrolling and um, shooing people out of public spaces, this shreds our community fabric, right? This destroys social structures that we've depended on for a hundred years, right? For, for maybe not thousands, of, if not thousands of years, right? Um, it also places the emphasis on us as individual workers and consumers rather than neighbors. And we start to see one another as um, not only competition, but maybe people that are trying to buy the thing that, uh, we otherwise wanted right because the only thing that society gives us to sort of fill this void is the ability to purchase things to consume things um so once again this makes us feel more alienated right we fill it more and more through this consumption we fill it more and more through you know going to applebee's or getting drinks with friends which these things are great but don't provide any sort of meaningful um social or meaningful fulfillment outside of maybe the occasional um social interaction that you have with people right so additionally due to this due to the fact that we don't have these meaningful social interactions and we also don't have these support systems to fall back on this leads to poverty because uh one expensive thing could could set us back uh, substantially um this leads us to feelings of um this leads us to uh, potentially turning towards crime to make those ends meet um but also this sort of uh, immiseration or this alienation um, leads us to lashing out and potentially committing acts of violence, such as mass shootings, as a way to sort of reclaim that sense of con control over our lives because it has, you know, been taken from us due to the fact that we're just people that go to work and go home and we don't have any sort of other uh, physical interactions with, with other people. Um, and so all of this then, once again, starts the cycle all over again because it creates crime and or it creates a sense of fear that justifies and promotes public safety and policing culture. So um, could you go next slide, please? So this is a, a, a great quote, I think, um, and also a, a great quote, uh, just not only about policing culture, but also um, to kind of emphasize Elizabeth's earlier point about um, 
the idea that Trump is a quote unquote felon, right? Um, and, that, and that that's bad and that's a slam dunk, right? There are certainly people who commit felonies that are bad people, but just because you've committed a crime or are a felon or are an ex-convict does not mean that um, you are necessarily a bad person or necessarily deserving of whatever punishment the state imposes upon you, right? Eugene V. Debs, a famous socialist activist and um, candidate for multiple offices in the United States said, while there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free, right? Um, this also draws a great comparison to famous renowned terrorists such as Nelson Mandela or famous ex-convicts such as MLK or Malcolm X, um, right? Just because somebody's a criminal doesn't mean that they're any less deserving of something and doesn't mean that they're, um, that, that this is a slam dunk as, uh, we sort of see in popular culture because of the cycle that we just talked about earlier, right? Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this is altogether why abolition must be at the heart of socialist struggle, right? This cycle is really difficult to interrupt and it's really difficult to stop these things from reproducing themselves, um, especially because the justice system is in many ways the sinew right, the muscle, the connective tissue of our existing society. It's the thing that arbitrates all, all of the different conflicts uh, among all of the different systems that make up this uh, American and international capitalist society that we live in, right? Um, because of that, abolition is the thing that could bring about socialism or is essential to bringing about socialism. On top of that, um, these... Uh, systems that we have to build as abolitionists are the systems that will eventually carry us into a socialist revolution or into a socialist future, right? And just as a violent and punitive justice system creates violence in all of these other systems, I'm sure many of you can think of these things right off the top of your head of the violence in some of these other systems, right? Um, a kind and caring justice system, given that it is this connective tissue, creates kind and caring systems elsewhere, right? Um, if we think of capitalism not as the economy, but as the entire social system, then the capitalist state is a key part of that. Um, by placing profit over meeting human needs, profit, aka what's known as surplus value, um, over human needs, which is known as use value, um, we, are, we are centering um, um, profit and property over everything else. And so what we're talking about is shifting to meeting human needs rather than capital needs. Um, and we want to address these deep inequalities rather than just simply managing them. So next slide, please. So this is very difficult to imagine. So um, due to that, let's maybe take a, let's hope that in the future, or maybe in a potential future um, uh, breakout room, that we can imagine these things and we can work together towards creating visions of the future that are abolitionists, that don't need policing. Um, and that people can can work together and depend on one another. So next, I will introduce um, my next comrade to discuss some potential frequently asked questions um, for uh, for abolitionists. Thank you, guys. All right, uh, it's me again, back to talk about some FAQs. So. Um, we're going to talk about some of the big and usually immediate questions and concerns that come up when we try to have conversations about abolition. If you didn't already have these questions coming into this night school, they will certainly come up as you talk to others about abolition. People are concerned, rightfully so, about cases of real interpersonal violence. If we get rid of police and prisons, what do we do about rapists and murderers, about serial killers and neo-Nazis? Um, and these are cases where there aren't necessarily easy and straightforward answers. But what we do know with certainty is that the current system is utterly failing to prevent and address these problems. Next slide. So that's why we've got to rethink the notion of punishment as public safety. So this first chart on the left, national estimates of allegations and substantiated incidents. So before looking at the trends here, just consider the numbers. There are tens of thousands of reported incidents of sexual violence inside prisons and jails committed by both staff and incarcerated people alike. And that's just what's reported, which we all know is incredibly difficult to do and is therefore a subset of actual incidents. If you are concerned about the problem of sexual violence in society, 
What becomes evident with this kind of data is that police and prisons are not only not any sort of solution to it, they are in fact a source of it. They perpetuate the problem. Women's prisons are full of victims of sexual and domestic violence who fought back against their abusers and ended up in jail, only to be further abused there. Now, this chart is a bit interesting because it's depicting changes in allegations of sexual violence, victims coming forward about it in the aftermath of some reforms. But as you can see, despite those changes, we see this other line of so-called substantiated in, in, uh, instances, which is another way of saying that basically nothing is done about it when people do come forward. Now, the second set of charts here in the middle shows that police are bad even at the jobs they claim to do, which is addressing violent crime. So here we see most crimes, even violent ones, are not reported. Of those that are, most of them are not solved, even in the traditional sense of prosecuting someone. And even in the so-called best case of a perpetrator getting prosecuted for a violent crime, well, the police clearly failed to prevent that violence from happening in the first place. They merely stepped in afterward to perpetuate it. And then this third chart shows how cops spend their time. And way down at the bottom is this itty bitty 4% sliver spent on violent crime. Everything else in this chart is in the criminalized existence category that Elizabeth went over earlier in that crime versus harm chart. And I should say that uncounted in all of these charts are the murders and assaults committed by police, which almost never get reported. And when they do, they are virtually guaranteed to get off scot-free, as we know. So the only conclusion we can draw from all this is that the police don't spend much time doing the job they claim they do. And when they do do it, they're simply bad at it. Not only that, they perpetuate the problems they pretend to address. Of course, as abolitionists, and I would argue cops themselves understand, uh, their actual job is violent social control, and they're pretty good at that. Now to this last question um, on, this, <clears throat> on this previous slide about neo-Nazis, many people rightfully so are genuinely concerned about how we protect marginalized people from neo-Nazis and other violent white supremacist groups uh, they think about, you know, the National Guard protecting Ruby Bridges in Arkansas after the federal school desegregation order, or the total occupation of the areas around the Capitol building uh, following January 6th of 2021. But the reality is that today, the most dangerous and violent neo-Nazi gangs are, in fact, the police themselves. And when it comes to protecting the most vulnerable, the least we could do is empower them with control over public safety so that they can decide for themselves what safety looks like. Next slide. So I'm just going to conclude this um, to circle back all the way back from uh, a slide that far, far went over way at the beginning. Um, another quote from Angela Davis. Prisons do not disappear social problems. They disappear human beings. Homelessness, unemployment, drug addiction, mental illness, and illiteracy are only a few of the problems that disappear from public view when the human beings contending with them are relegated to cages. Abolitionists speak a lot of carceral logic, the logic that basically says, well, the way to solve crime is to put the perpetrators somewhere else. That somewhere else is often a literal cage, but sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's an ankle monitor, sometimes it's being on parole or probation, in which the bounds of your life are so confined and controlled by the state that it is hardly a life at all. And reformists who long for a police force and prison system that somehow isn't racist still believe in this logic that punishment and deprivation are routes to redemption and that the threat of punishment will prevent harmful behavior. But what history has shown is that, well, we've been addressing these problems in this way for centuries and still the problems remain. So I think a little creativity, which we'll get into shortly in the breakouts, can go a long way to creating programs that do address the root causes of these problems. We may never eliminate them entirely, but we can certainly do a hell of a lot better in the current carceral system. And we can and we must do it without having the state perpetuate violence itself. Uh, next slide. So uh, that's just a way of approaching those burning questions that you know everyone who's new to abolition has. And we'll transition into breakouts where you'll be uh, discussing uh, aspects of abolition in smaller groups, but first we wanted to give space for anyone to ask us presenters any other burning questions you might have. 
uh, feel free to raise your hand, put yourself on stack in the chat, or just write a question in the chat. Uh, I put myself on stack. Go so, for it. All right. Uh, I just had a couple questions. Um, one was uh, uh, as far as um, neo Nazis go. Uh, as yes, I, one of y'all mentioned at the start of this, at some point, black people as a group, particularly black men, were not allowed to arrest uh, white criminals as police officers. Uh, but it's also true that they were allowed to not only uh, police their own uh, area, community, whatever, but to uh, to be a police, a black police officer was seen as uh, a pride of the community, a uh, asset, uh, a benefit to the race. So, um, if abolition is to is to be strived for, and the and according to y'all, it includes eliminating police as a group. How would um, a solely minority, particularly black police force, um, being gone? Uh, keep uh, neo-Nazis from doing God knows what. So in this example of, of the question I'm giving you, an area has a not, uh, all minority, particularly all black police force. And the abolition says, you're gone. Get another job. And neo-Nazis show up. Yeah, so uh, this is a good question and a, and a tricky one. Um, the, the way I would think about it is that what the hypothetical situation that you have named is not reflective of what actual policing is, right? The black police officers that exist are participating in a system that is predicated on the violent social control of racialized communities, you know, black communities. And so the, I think the situation that you are uh, presenting is more of something like as if the the old Black Panther Party proposal to have community control over police were actually realized, which is that the community decides for itself, and this is what I just mentioned in my previous question, what safety looks like for them, and they create their own force to protect themselves. Now, that force, if that truly were uh, possible and came about, would I? It, there's no reason to call them police because they are serving a fundamentally different function. And abolitionists would not argue for their elimination. Um, there are many people who see uh, true community control as a route to abolition, um, as a way to get us through um, a period where communities are still facing threats and need to protect themselves. Interesting. Thanks. I have a burning question. So, uh, my, okay, my name is Aguilas, pronouns they, he, she. So uh, my question is, how can we make the maximum progress on police abolition in the shortest amount of time without being met with violence from police, neo-Nazis, and other groups that might support um, state violence against the general population? Thank you. Um, I'll just, if any of my other comrades want to take that, you're welcome to. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll just say this is a topic of uh, much debate within abolitionist organizing spaces like our own. Um, it's a really hard thing to do, obviously. Fighting against the police state and against police power provokes, you know, doing that effectively provokes police repression in itself. Um, so I think many abolitionists would say that one way to do it is to build communities outside of, uh, you know, uh, uh, build community solidarity and basically support systems that are independent of the state in order to essentially build the capacity for communities to take care of themselves and render traditional policing obsolete. Um, and, you know, my personal opinion is it's got to be a bit of both where we have to fight 
the police state and reduce police power while also building those all alternatives. Um, and we've got to be prepared and organized and strategic about how we deal with the ensuing repression that we're undoubtedly going to face. And uh, <clears throat> add to Ben's point, um, we part of what we're doing here is this through education is a is a big part of that too, um, because we need to also have the people um, kind of unsubscribe from that the culture of policing, the culture of the police state, and the culture of calling the police for everything. So. Things like education um, and community can really help uh, influence everybody to kind of believe in a different system because that's like the immaterial way of how it's going to happen and not like the violent way is that we're going to create, you know, a different belief, a different culture that better things are possible and that we have communities that can handle themselves without cops. Um, I know we have more questions in the chat. Um, I see some hands raised, but I'm going to suggest that we move to our breakout rooms because those are places where you will be able to discuss those same questions um, with uh, just a smaller group of people because um, we are running a little bit behind on time. Um, so I think that I'm gonna hand it over to Georgia to take us to those breakouts. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Ben, so much, and everyone for bringing your questions and your enthusiasm. Uh, Georgia, they and she pronouns, and we are going to get right into these breakouts in the interest of time. So what is going to happen, um, you can go to the next slide, um, is, and one more, please, is now that we've discussed the system, we've discussed what's broken about it, but we know we were all socialized, like we talked about at the top of the presentation, we're all socialized into these understandings about the cops, what they're for, what they do or don't do. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. So John is gonna drop a link. He just dropped it into the chat. Go ahead and click on that, have it open. When you're sent to your breakout room, what you're gonna do is look at the number of your breakout room and then click the corresponding link on that page and it'll take you to your Jamboard. We're gonna discuss four questions and they will be written on your Jamboard for you. Uh, what makes you uneasy about a world without police or prisons? What are your concerns, misgivings, or fears about that, a world with, uh, without police or prisons? And what concerns have you heard from others? Alternatively, what excites you about a world without police or prisons? And when's the last time you saw or interacted with a cop and how did it make you feel? So you're gonna take a couple minutes in your group um, first, just look at the Jamboard, look at the questions. You can write some comments on a sticky note um, by clicking the bar on the left-hand side of the screen, and then spend some time in your group and chat with the folks who are there. So everyone, please, again, take a sec, click on the link that John dropped into the chat, and I'm going to ask our Zoom help to go ahead and send everyone to breakout rooms, please. All right. Everyone should have a room pop up for them. Feel free to join. All right, we're just waiting for some folks to get back in here. We'll do a quick report back and then wrap it up. All right, welcome back, everybody. I think we got, yeah, I feel it looks like we got a majority of folks coming back in here. Um, so like I said, everyone had a different kind of like alternate uh, to policing slideshow. Is there one or two people that might want to report back on what their alternate was and what folks were talking about from any of the breakout rooms? I can go. Um, uh, since I was in your group, um, we talked about uh, uh, intimate partner violence, specifically domestic violence, um, and the imagination scenario was: uh, what if, when you're, if some, you or somebody experiencing partner violence, you were able to text um, a trauma-informed crisis intervention specialist, meet you in a safe place, and you'd be working together on a plan that would keep you safe in the long term as an alternative to calling the police. Um, and we talked about how uh, if the police didn't exist. Um, uh, what things that we would need to address intimate partner violence include having a network of safe places and trusted people, 
um, where folks can go and feel like they have their needs met, um, and specifically centering the victim or survivor and asking them what they need, um, and really getting uh, folks in, in a place where they feel stable and, and, and are okay enough to and have uh, people that they can talk to um, about the situation uh, without necessarily the expectation of carceral harm. Um, and we talked about in general uh, to make all this possible to make everything safer without police. We need to address most of our fundamental human needs and have free access to food, housing, uh, mental health care, and crisis resources, um, and really emphasize uh, education from a young age um, that combats uh, the uh, uh, sexism, homophobia, racism, and other underlying causes of intimate partner violence and violence within communities. So that was our talk. Lots of stuff. Yeah, that was a lot. Thanks so much, Amanda, for telling everyone what our group was talking about. Um, how about anyone from breakout room two? I don't know who was in it, but somebody from breakout two, tell me what your graphic was and what you guys talked about. We, we just started to uh, address the issue. If, if someone causes harm, what, uh, what can they do to um, make up for the harm they caused? That's perfect. Do you guys have any ideas on that? Or just get into it? Anyone else have any ideas? You can put it in the chat. If somebody causes harm, how can we kind of work through that and find redemption? So somebody actually said um, that uh they want to get rid of guns. I disagree with um, with the idea of banning guns. I think that uh, minority communities and women especially and the LGBT community definitely lack, um, how, how do I say this? Basically guns should be put in the hands of people who lack the ability to protect themselves on their own rather than in the hands of the police who actually increase the murder rate and, um, you know, are known for their brutality and the various ways in which they, they um, inflict more violence on the community, not less. Um, I mean, as a Marxist, uh, I definitely, um, I definitely strongly believe in uh, the quote that, um, this quote from Marx uh, that uh, the something along the lines of like, like the right, not the right to bear arms, sorry, uh, the arms of the workers should not be frustrated, something like that. I feel like everybody here knows that quote. Um, yeah, so that's that's my stance on it. Totally. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. That makes sense. Then Chelsea brought up a good point. Get rid of guns for the police like the EU does. I think there's definitely a lot of countries trying different things to address the gun problem. But um, yeah, when it comes to harm, principles of transformative justice, you absolutely got to talk to the person who experienced harm first and figure out what they would need to heal and kind of go from there. So these are some great ideas. Um, I appreciate everyone who contributed in the breakouts. Um, I'm going to move forward, but uh, a few of us are going to stay on after nine, but I just want to get through our content. And then after nine, we'll stay on and we can keep having these conversations and keep kind of like ping ponging back and forth if people want to stay on. But I do want to go ahead and go to our next slide just so everyone gets to see this. Um, this is a really great flow chart um, that just like save it down on your phone, have it as a resource, steps, alternative steps for what to do instead of calling the police. This is one of the best things that as abolitionists that we can do is just pause and ask ourselves, do we really need to call the police and what can we do? So um, this is a great way to do that. We wanna work towards creating the conditions in our neighborhood that allow for this chart too, to kind of go out to its full fruition. Um, but look for those in your community, start those alternatives if they don't exist. But we're, I saw in the chat, there was a great conversation about how a lot of these resources already exist in the DMV area and we should be calling them instead. So. That is definitely great there. Um, next slide after that. So then I'm just gonna talk about a few more uh, kind uh, of- Can we have a, um, oh, a sorry. St direct response stack in the chat? Oh, I see, sorry about that. Uh, Elizabeth, stack response. 
Sorry, I'll make this really quick. I just wanted to share an example because Keely, you had asked about how do we repair harm. Um, I came across this really incredible story of two college students um, and Anwin and Samir, not their real names, but Samir raped Anwin in college. They were in a casual relationship and one night he raped her. And he didn't understand that he raped her for a while, but through education that he saw out on his own, as well as, you know, just a number of different factors that I think the the climate of education that we want to that we want to foster through abolitionist, you know, approaches uh, led him to understand that he had raped her. And as part of his repair plan to her, he apologized to her. He also agreed to perform a spoken word piece with her about the night of the rape, where they both explained how they experienced it. Um, and he also wrote an article about it in his university magazine with his own name on it, explaining what he had done and how he um, understood what he did wrong and how he and Anwen had worked together to repair the harm by centering her needs. Um, they graduated from college in 2016. They still FaceTime. Um, so it's just a really remarkable story of healing and accountability and growth. And I just wanted to share with everyone because it was very incredible when I first came across it. Thank you, Elizabeth. That is definitely a great story and um, answers one of those really frequently asked questions, hard questions about these really hard experiences and what can we do and how can we heal together as a society. So thank you for sharing that. Um, definitely a lot of like energy around this. So we will be staying on after nine if people want to keep chatting. Um, just some next steps though. Um, so just so we can be cognizant of time. Um, if you go to the next slide, basically a lot of this is, it's complex. You're going to have to keep learning. Yeah, we've provided a lot of additional examples here, books, guides, articles. We are constantly working and struggling together to ask these hard questions and then build the futures that, um, you know, give those answers to those hard questions. So I really recommend any of these. Again, we'll be sending out um, this PowerPoint. So we'll have links for all of these things. Um, so check those out. I'm not a part of DSA. Get plugged in with us. Get plugged in with the DSA abolition working groups in both DC and NOVA. We've got a lot of really great things going on. This presentation was part of our Root Causes of Harm campaign. We are continuing to try and address those root causes of harm, explain them to our communities. One of the great things that we're doing um, coming up next month is we're doing a Kids Not Cops backpack drive. You can donate at that GoFundMe link um, to help supply those funds for, or sorry, supply the backpacks for the kids in our community. Um, we're really, really excited about that kind of mutual aid project. And then we've got a couple of other things going on in the fall, a reading group to keep struggling through this together. Um, we'll be leading that and doing a walking tour. And our NOVA branch has some really great ideas coming up. Um, doing a political prisoner letter writing event, um, learning from our elders, learning from our comrades who are struggling and have been put into prison. So that's really great. And then also their, their upcoming We Keep Us Safe campaign. They'll be doing a bunch of like tangible things like Narcan training, street medic trainings, just these like down and dirty things that if we can educate people in our community on how to, to do these, we can stop some of these harms right there at the root. So that's kind of what's going on with abolition. And then if you go to the next slide, you can see what's going on in DSA as a whole. Um, we've got a couple of different things. We're fighting back against the uh, Kids Online Safety Act, which is kind of a misnomer name. It's actually a bad bill that just passed the Senate today. It's heading to the House. There's still time to call and email your electeds about this. It's anti-LGBTQT+. It's a bad internet censorship bill. This link that we send out will have information on there. And same thing, WePower is we're calling our electives to stop some Pepco price hikes um, over the next couple of years. And if you're in the Nova region, um, a lot of this comes down to electoral politics. And um, we know as DC is not a state, we don't get the federal level representation, but Nova does. They're constantly planning to fight back, create these better conditions in their environments. They've got a monthly social on August 1st. And then if you're new to DSA, like I said, please come join a new member orientation. We've got one coming up on August 14th. I think we do that relatively frequently. Um, so we will send the link out for that. And not DSA, but pretty tangential is the DC for Ceasefire Coalition. Um, they are doing a really great idea of brainstorming ward specific actions um, so that we can get our, our, our DC council um, to sign a resolution for a ceasefire. That's gonna be August 4th, 4 p.m. at City State Brewing here in DC. So definitely check all of those things out. Again, I will um, send all this out. We've got the links. And then please, 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 if you have more questions and you want to talk about any of the breakout rooms, stay on. Uh, all of our organizers will stay on for a couple more minutes and we will work through that together. But I really appreciate everyone coming out tonight. This is a great turnout and I appreciate all the presenters. Um, you'll have a lot of knowledge and I learned something new. So thank you, thank you, thank you.
Um, and yeah, we'll be around. Stay in the chat, pop in the chat. Otherwise, adios. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye.